بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم إننا نعوذ بك من علم لا ينفع من قلب لا يخشع من نفس لا تشبع ومن دعوة لا يستجاب لها أما بعد فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته حياكم الله وبياكم أحبتي في الله to another class, another gathering in studying the hadith of Jabir رضي الله عنه on the hajj of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and today alhamdulillah we continue with day three of the explanation of this hadith and in yesterday's class day two we ended the class speaking about the talbiyah and Jabir radiallahu anhu he said that he raised his voice meaning the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he raised his voice making the talbi talbiyah and he expressed the word talbiyah to being as a tawheed and this is a clear evidence to show that the concept of tawheed the oneness of allah was present even during the time of the salaf and a rebuttal against those who believe, who falsely assume that the concept of Tawheed is an innovation that has only appeared in the latter generations. Here's a clear hadith from the Sahih of Imam Muslim where Jabir uses the word Tawheed, showing that this idea and this phrase was present during the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's just a benefit I forgot to mention and highlight. In yesterday's class Today we move on to what Jabir said قَالَ جَابِرٌ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ He said لَسْنَا نَنْوِي إِلَّا الْحَجِّ لَسْنَا نَعْرِفُ الْعُمْرَةَ حَتَّى إِذَا أَتَيْنَا الْبَيْتَ مَعْهُ إِسْتَلَمَ الرُّكْنَ فَرَمَلَ ثَلَاثًا وَمَشَاء أَرْبَعًا Which could be translated to mean We did not have any other intention But that of Hajj only or But that of only Hajj Being unaware of the Umrah at that season but when we came with him to the house, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi he touched the black stone and made seven rounds around the Kaaba, walking fast, three of them, the first three, and walking normally for the rest of the four. The reason why Jabir radiallahu anhu made this phrase, he said this phrase, لَسْنَا نَنْوِي إِلَّا الْحَجَّةِ لَسْنَا نَعْرِفُ الْعُمْرَةَ We did not have any other intention but that of Hajj only, being unaware of the Umrah at that season. Is because during that time and before that time, the Mushrikun, Ikhwan, Akhwat, the polytheists of Quraysh, they didn't they did not perform Umrah during the times of Hajj. And they saw that doing Umrah during this time, during these Ashhurul Hajj, was considered to be the worst of sins that a person could engage in. So they saw that the only act of worship as it relates to Hajj and Umrah that can be performed during this time was the Hajj by itself and no Umrah. And also during that time, they performed the Hajj not in Dhul Hijjah, but rather in Dhul Qa'dah. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man arada minkum an yuhilla bi hajjin wa umratin fal yaf'al. Wa man arada an yuhilla bi hajjin fal yuhil. Wa man arada an yuhilla bi umratin fal yuhil. He came and abolished this practice. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And he said that whoever among you Wants to Make the talbiyah enter into ihram With the intention of hajj and umrah At the same time Then let him do so And whoever wants to do hajj by itself Then do so And whoever wants to enter into umrah By itself during these times Without doing the hajj Then let him do so طيب. And this is one of the instances where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam opposed the Mushrikun, the polytheists of Quraysh, in the Hajj. In fact, <coughs> there are seven instances where Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he opposed the Mushrikun of Quraysh as it relates to the rights of Hajj and Umrah. The first instance is that the Mushrikun did not perform Umrah during the Hajj season. 
and they saw that it was the worst sin, as we just mentioned. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi opposed this action via the statement we just recited, we just said, and also through his action. As we know that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi made Umrah how many times, Ikhwani and Khawat, we mentioned it yesterday. How many times did Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi make uh, Umrah? Four times. Sentum. Naam. And all of them were done in the month of Dhul Qa'dah. SubhanAllah. So the Mushrikun saw it was haram to do Umrah during Dhul Qa'dah in the months of the Hajj season. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi made it a point to make all of his four Umrahs during the time of Dhul Qa'dah. Everyone understand this? So this is the first instance in how he opposed the Mushrikun. The second instance is in relation to how Tawaf was made. The Mushrikun of Quraysh at that time, they made Tawaf how? They made it naked, right? It comes in narration that كانت المرأة تطوف بالبيت وهي عريانة That there was a woman, right? That because they would um, perform Tawaf naked, there was a woman who would perform Tawaf naked and she would say, اليوم يبدو بعضه أو كله وما بدا منه فلا أحله يعني today some of it may show it or all of it and whatever is exposed from it I do not permit it to those who are looking at it and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse يَا بَنِي آدَمَ خُذُوا زِينَتَكُمْ عِنْدَ كُلِّ مَسْجِدٍ O descendants of Adam O children of Adam take your beautification in every masjid يعني beautify yourself clothe yourself when you go to the masjid طيب and of course masjid haram and any other masjid from the Masajid of Allah, Allah. So this is another instance in how the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu opposed the Mushrikun by adorning clothing, whether it be regular clothing outside of Umrah and Hajj, or the or wearing the libas al ihram, the rida and izar, the two articles of clothing, while in the state of ihram, making tawaf around the Kaaba. The third instance in how the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam opposed the Quraysh in the Hajj rites is that during that time, the Hims people of Quraysh, a select um, tribe found in Quraysh during the time of Mecca, at that time who lived specifically in Mecca, there were a group of people, there were a tribe, and they considered themselves to be from the people of Haram, right? They said, نَحْنُ أَحْلُ الْحَرَمْ فَلَا نَخْرُجُ مِنْهُ and because they were the people of the Haram, they did not leave the Haram boundary. Okay? They did not leave the Haram boundary when they performed Hajj. So that means that they did not exit the Haram boundary and they did not go to the Arafah. They did not go to Al Arafah. The Prophet of Allah, he opposed them in this regard by saying, Al Hajju Arafah, that Hajj is Arafah. He made Arafah a pillar of the Hajj, meaning that. Those who do not go to Arafah do not have a Hajj. It's from the pillars of the Hajj to go to Arafah. The fourth way in how the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi opposed the polytheists of Quraysh as it relates to the Hajj rites is that those who are not from the the Hims people okay and they went to Arafah among the Mushrikun of Quraysh. They went to Arafah, okay? They were not from the tribe of the Hims, but other Arabs from the polytheists. They went to Arafah, but they would leave before the sun has set. They would leave before the sun has set. And the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu opposed them in this regard. And he remained in Arafah until Maghrib entered, until the sun set. Now. So he remained in Arafah up until Maghrib. And then he departed to Muzdalifa and prayed Maghrib and Isha together in Muzdalifa. The fifth way in how he opposed the Mushrikun is that the Mushrikun at that time, they did not, when they were in Muzdalifa, they did not leave Muzdalifa until after the sun has, uh, the, after the sun rose, after Tulur al Shams. Okay? So after Fajr, they remained there up until sunset, uh, or rather sunrise. They remained there up until sunrise. And then once the sun was risen, that's when they would depart. This is the Mushrikun during that time. The Prophet of Allah, وسلم, 
He opposed them in this regard by leaving after the Fajr Salah before the sun rose. طيب, this narration, uh, Amr bin Maymun, he mentioned, كنا نوقوفا مع عمر رضي الله عنه بجمع فقال إن أهل الجاهلية كانوا لا يفيضون حتى تطلع الشمس that the people of Jahiliyyah, they would not depart from Muzdalifa until the sun has risen. And they would say, Ashriq Thabir wa an kayma nughir. They would say, yani, let the sun rise from the mountain Thabir, let the sun rise. Right? In Muzdalifa, there was a mountain there. There is a mountain there, and they refer to it as being Thabir. They say, wait until the sun has risen above this mountain. Wa an kayma nughir. Yani, and then we'll be in order for us to leave Muzdalifa and go on to slaughter on that day, yani Yom al Nahar, the next day. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he opposed him in this regard. He opposed him in this regard by leaving before the sun has risen. Okay, after praying, Salatul Fajr. The sixth way in how the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu opposed the Mushrikun at that time is that the polytheists at that time would stop at a valley that's referred to as Wadi Muhassir. Wadi Muhassir is a valley, okay, where the Mushrikun would stop and they would remember their virtuous people from their forefathers and their uh, fathers and grandfathers, etc. The right, the righteous among them, the, in their eyes, they would remember them at this valley. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam opposed them in this regard by rushing through this area and not stopping at this area. طيب وادي محسر. He he would walk faster and try to pass through it quickly, so as to oppose the mushrikun. And some people say that this is the area, yani wadi muhassir, this is the area where the story of the fil, ashab al fil, occurred. Nam, the elephant, and Abraha, the king from Yemen, right? He came to destroy the Kaaba so that people will come to his building in his country, his land. But of course, we know Allah prevented that. Nam, some people said that this is where. The, the story had occurred. However, this is a fabrication. This is not correct. Why? Because Wadi Muhassir is in the Haram area. It's in the bounds of the Haram. Okay? And the Ashab al field they did not even enter the Haram area. The, the elephant would have, would, did not pass. He stopped before entering the Haram boundary. طيب. So this is a, uh, a story that's found in the books of Sira, but it's fabricated and it's wrong. The seventh way in how the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam opposed the Mushrikun in the Hajrites is, the, is in the Talbiyah. During the time of the Mushrikun, when they will make Talbiyah, they will say, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, Labbaik la Sharika Lak. And then they will add, Illa Sharikan Huwa Lak, Tamliku Huwa Ma Malak. You have no partner except a partner that you have. Tamliku Huwa Ma Malak. You own it and that which it owns. Right? The, yani they were associating a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were committing polytheism. They were committing polytheism. Like shirk. In their talbiyah. A statement of tawheed. They associated partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they would do this. While making tawaf in the, ha the house of Allah subhanallah. The Prophet of Allah subhanahu opposed them in this regard two ways. One. The actual wording, as we learned in the last class, the wording of Talbiyah, it became a phrase of Tawheed. And this is why Jabir said, فَأَهَلَّ بِالتَّوْحِيد يعني It was a pure statement of Tawheed, the oneness of Allah. And secondly, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, instead of saying it while he was making Tawaf, like the Mushrikun, he stopped once he reached the Black Stone. Once he began his Tawaf, that's when he stopped the Talbiyah. And these are seven instances or eight instances. We break down the Talbiyah into two parts. And how the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu opposed the Mushrikun in the Hajrites. Now, here 
It mentions we did not have any other intention but that of Hajj only being unaware of the Umrah at that season. But when we came to the house, he touched the black stone. It mentions here, حتى إذا أتينا البيت معه استلم الركنة. But when we came to that house, استلم <coughs> الركنة. When we came to the house, this was on the 4th of Dhul Hijjah, which was a Monday at that time. It was the 4th of Dhul Hijjah on a Monday. And this part of the hadith, Ikhwari Khawat, is evidence to show that whenever someone enters into Ihram, whenever you enter into Ihram, you should hasten to begin the Hajj rites and do not delay, unless you have a valid reason otherwise. You should not delay fulfilling the rights of Allah in this regard, unless you have a valid reason for the delay. Like, for example, exhaustion. Sometimes people are extremely tired. They cannot fulfill the tawaf, the rights of the tawaf and the sa'i, unless they rest up a little bit. And there's nothing wrong with that. Or if they're sick, right? Unable to move. Or if it's extremely crowded, it's okay to delay. Or if it's extremely hot, like between Zuhur and Asr, it's okay to delay. Other than that, the origin is that you should try to fulfill it as, uh, as fast as possible. Not as fast as possible, you, know, you fulfill it without delay. Without delay. طيب نعم and there's a narration in the Sahihain in which Aisha رضي الله عنها she said أنه أول شيء بدأ به حين قدم أنه توضع ثم طاف بالبيت Aisha رضي الله عنها described the actions of the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم by saying that the first thing he started with when he entered Mecca is that he made wudu, and then he made the tawaf around the Kaaba. He made the tawaf around the Kaaba. Yani he did not delay. He did not delay. Khayr. Once the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu reached the Kaaba, he stopped the talbiyah. Okay? It says here, Hatta idha atayna al-bayta ma'ahu istalama rukna So he stopped the talbiyah. <laughs> And this is legislated, that you stop the talbiyah once you begin the tawaf. Tayyib. As it relates to reciting the talbiyah again, then, as it relates to the one who comes for umrah, okay, just umrah without any hajj, or they come for tamattur, yani the umrah, and then the hajj, these two types of people, when they finish the Umrah, okay, when they start the Umrah by doing the Tawaf, they start the Talbiyah and they do not continue after it. Yani, they do not continue Talbiyah. Once they stop the Talbiyah, that's it. It's over for them. As for the one who comes for Hajj with the intent of Ifrad or Mufrid or Qiran, right, the Qarin, then these two types of people these two types of hajis, okay? When they stop the talbiyah at the commencement of the tawaf, once they've finished their tawaf and their sa'i, and, they, and their sa'i, yani walking between Safa and Marwa, after they completed their sa'i, then they continue, the, they continue their talbiyah, okay? They continue their talbiyah. And this is due to them still being in their ihram. This is due to them still being in their ihram. All right, so this is the difference. The one who comes from Umrah alone, or the one who comes with the intention of Hajjud Tamatur. Once they start their tawaf, they stop their talbiyah, and they do not repeat it, and they have finished. As for the mufrid and the qarin, they stop their talbiyah once they start their tawaf, and once they've completed their sa'i, they continue their talbiyah. They continue their talbiyah. Everyone understand this? And this is due to the action of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as mentioned by Fadl bin Abbas, right? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what type of hajj did he make? He made Qiran. He made Qiran. So Al-Fadl bin Abbas, radiallahu anhu, he said, أَنَّهُ كَانَ رَدِيفَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Sallam فَلَمْ يَزَدْ يُلَبِّي حَتَّى رَمَى الْجَمْرَةَ أَلَّتِي عِنْدَ الْأَقَبَةِ يَوْمَ النَّحَرِ So, the Prophet of Allah continued after he did the 
Sa'i, he continued to make the talbiya until he stoned the jamra that was on or that was in the aqaba, okay, on the day of Nahr. That's when he stopped his talbiya. Naam. Mufrid and, Qan and Mufrid and Qanin is a description of the type of hajj a person does. Okay, Naba, yani, the ansakul hajj, okay, are three. You have tamattu'. This is when you do a umrah, and then you do a hajj. You have qarin, and then you have mufrid. Uh, we explained this before. Tayyip, perhaps uh, you can review the recording. Inshallah, details are there. He touched the black stone. I mentioned in this narration, he touched the black stone. And what's meant by him touching, sallallahu alayhi wa touching the black stone, is that he directly kissed it. And this is the best form of istilam. Istilam is of different types. The best form of it is to kiss it directly. And there's benefits as it relates to the black stone, ikhwan al-khawat. It's a narration collected by Imam Ahmad, Imam Tirmidhi, and others, that the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa said, Yati hadha al-hajru yawm al-qiyamah. That this hajar, yani the black stone, will come on a day of judgment and it will have two eyes in which it will see with and it will have a tongue in which it will speak with. Of course, Allah, Allah is able to do whatever He wishes. So this is not something far-fetched to believe. And it will bear witness for those who touched it, who touched it, who truly touched it, yani with due right. طيب. And the black stone, uh, some people mistakenly think, we know that the black stone, of course, is the stone that came from Jannah, Nam, and it turned black because of the sins of Adam. Nam. And some people, they have a misconception as it relates to this black stone. And they believe that it has barakah in it. That there's barakah in it. So they go to extreme lengths and practice actions that are not legislated in our sharia. And they have beliefs that are not legislated. Rather, it is uh, it opposes the beliefs of Islam. So they, can, they think that the black stone is a source of barakah. طيب? And this is a mistake. Rather, the barakah, the barakah is not in the stone. Rather, the barakah is in following the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That this is where the barakah lies. Following the Sunnah, learning Islam the way it was revealed and following it in the same manner, without any addition nor subtraction. Just following it the same way it was revealed. This is where the barakah lies. And there's a perfect example of this. Umar bin Khattab, one time he kissed the black stone. And he wonderfully said, after kissing it, Inni la a'lamu annaka hajar. Certainly I know that you are just a stone. La tadurru wa la tanfa'. You do not harm, nor do you benefit. Walaw la anni ra'itu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa yuqabbiluk ma qabbaltuka. And if I had not seen that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if I had not seen him kiss you, or kiss you, yani it, then I would have not kissed you. But he only kissed the black stone because he was following the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is our belief, ikhwani akhwat, that there's no barakah in the stone itself. Rather, the barakah is in following the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as it relates to touching the black stone, then there are levels. There are five different levels as it relates to touching the black stone. One, the best level is that a person kisses it directly, like what the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam did in this narration. طيب. You kiss it directly. The second level is to touch it with your hand and then kiss your hand. To touch the black stone with your hand and then kiss your hand. The third level is to touch it with a stick or the stub of a stick or the handle of a stick or anything. Right? It could be the handle of an umbrella, for example. Anything. You touch it with that item, and then you kiss the item where it touched the black stone. The fourth level, if you're unable to do any of that, <coughs> is to point to it. And if you point to it, 
then you do not kiss your hand. You do not kiss your hand because you didn't touch it. When you point to the stone, did you touch the stone? No, so you don't kiss it. Is it this is different than actually touching it. Like many people you see in Tawaf of Amistan, they just do whatever they think. This is a mistake. We have to follow the sunnah as it is. Like, and the fifth level is mentioned by Ibn Abbas عنهما, is to make sujood on it. Yani worshipping Allah, right? And making sujood on it. Like, um, as it relates to touching the black stone, ikhwan and khawat, that this is what as the people of knowledge they mention, it is a sunnah fi ibadah. It is an, a sunnah that is found within ibadah, contained within an act of worship. And it's not a general sunnah, meaning that touching the black stone at any part of the day, at any time, in any circumstance, is considered to be mubah. It is a permissible action. Touching the black stone itself, right? In any circumstance, it's considered to be mubah, meaning you're not rewarded nor are you punished. However, it becomes legislated, meaning that it becomes misnoon, it becomes recommended to touch the black stone meaning you're rewarded for doing it in one of three instances. The origin with touching the black stone is that it's permissible. If you do it, there's no reward, okay? And there's no punishment. When are you rewarded for touching the black stone? In one of three instances. One is when you're doing the tawaf, as we see in this hadith. Okay, you're doing the umrah. Okay? While you're doing the tawaf. What did it say in narration? Istalam al rukna That the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu when he came to the bait, Hatta idha atayna al bayta ma'ahu, Istalam al rukna He touched the black stone. So this is in the tawaf. How do we know that this is in the tawaf? Look what it say immediately after that. فَوْرَمَلَ ثَلَاثُ وَمَشَاءَ أَرْبَعًا That he made seven rounds. The first three he walked fast. He performed ramal. And the last four, he walked normally. When do you do this? You do this during the tawaf. Okay? So this is the first instance where it's legislated, meaning it's sunnah, you're rewarded for doing it. The second instance is every time you pass by it, yani at the end of each round. At the end of each round, it is legislated, it is recommended to either kiss it or touch it or point to it, the, other, the, the all the other uh, instances we just mentioned a few moments ago. And the third time where it's recommended to touch it or kiss it, etc., is after you've completed two units behind Maqam Ibrahim. Okay? This is after you've completed the two units behind Maqam Ibrahim. And this is restricted to the type of tawaf that is followed by sa'i. Yani you do this if the tawaf that you're doing is followed by a sa'i. Khairan, that's when you go back to the black stone and you point to it or touch it, etc. However, if it's just a tawaf without any sa'i, then you do not have to go back. And we'll see in this hadith the instance, it mentions that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa after completing praying behind the Maqam Ibrahim, he went back. Look, فَاسْتَلَمَهُ mentions right here. ثُمَّ رَجَعَ right after praying the two rakah and saying these surahs in each rakah. ثُمَّ رَجَعَ إِلَى رُكْنِ فَاسْتَلَمَهُ ثُمَّ خَرَجَ مِنَ الْبَابِ إِلَى الصَّفَى Then he returned to the black stone and kissed it. He then went to the gate of al-Safa and and as he reached it, etc., to the end of the hadith. So this shows that if it if it is a tawaf that is followed by a sa'i, you return back to the black stone. If not, like for example, you're just doing the seven tawaf because you're a resident or because you're just worshiping Allah, just regularly just doing it, and there's no sa'i after it, 
<coughs> or you delay your sa'i later on, then you do not return back to the black stone. Everyone understand this? These are the three instances where you're rewarded. You're performing a sunnah for touching the black stone. Outside of that, right, if you just want to go to the Kaaba and just touch it, then it's mubah. It's not an act of worship. You're not rewarded for doing so. It's just mubah. Why is it just mubah? Because of the action of Prophet Muhammad He did not touch it outside of these instances. Everyone understand this? Naam. In the hadith it mentions, and he made seven rounds around the Kaaba. ثُمَّ نَفَذَ إِلَى مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ فَقَرَأَ نعم. Uh, ومشا... نعم. فَرَمَلَ ثَلَافًا وَمَشَاء أَرْبَعًا Meaning that he made the tawaf. Why did he make tawaf? Because Allah commanded him. وَلْيَتَّوَّفُوا بِالْبَيْتِ الْعَتِيقِ بِالْبَيْتِ الْعَتِيقِ Allah commanded Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه and his companions, and let them make the tawaf at the ancient house, meaning the Kaaba. How to make tawaf? Allah gave a command how, make, how to make the tawaf, right? How do you do the tawaf? Did Allah mention a number? No. Did Allah mention do it seven times? No. So how do we know we do it seven times? Through the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu for what purpose? لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ in order for you to clarify to the people how. Clarify to the people what was revealed to them. Showing that it's a clear refutation against those who say and claim that they only follow the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an was only revealed for Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to clarify its meanings. This is what Allah says in the Qur'an. SubhanAllah. These people who claim that they only follow the Qur'an in reality, they only follow their desires. And they haven't even opened up the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an is a witness against their own statement. Allah revealed the Qur'an with the sunnah, ikhwan akhwat. These two things are together. al kitab wal hikmah And the wisdom. Allah calls the Qur'an, Allah calls the sunnah, al-hikmah, the wisdom. SubhanAllah, it is the wisdom of the Qur'an. It's mentioned by Imam Shafi'i. That al-hikmah refers to the sunnah. So this shows that the Qur'an, a person cannot be guided until you take the Qur'an along with the sunnah. Naam. How do you pray? Allah tells us, established to pray. How do we pray? The details of the salah. It's not mentioned in the Qur'an. It's only mentioned in the sunnah. طيب. So yeah, we need to be aware of this and may Allah protect us all against our desires and guide us to the straight path. Amin. So how did the Prophet make tawaf? How did he interpret it? How did he interpret this verse? Yani kayfa? by performing he walked fast in the first three and then he walked normally for the four and the word here for ramal this refers to suratul mashi ma bil khuta yani walking fast while taking short steps okay similar to jogging all right it's not running as fast as you can like it's a sprint like a sprint. Well, Mr. When you go to the Kaaba, you see some weird things. People are doing some interesting things. May Allah guide us all. See people, it's like a track race. MashaAllah, Usain Bolt. La, this is not Ramal. Ramal is kind of like jogging. You're running, you're, walk, you're moving fast, but your feet is, is close to each other. Each step is close, taking short steps, not long strides. And... Okay. This is the concept of Raman. Now, some people can try sprinting. You go on the first floor, second floor, third floor is more space. During the day after Zuhur, there's more space in the Mataf area. People, I mean, this is something witness. Shahad, I mean. And this is what the Prophet did during the first three units, the first three rounds of the Tawaf. Another thing that the Prophet ﷺ did at this time was something called al tiba al And that is uncovering your right shoulder for males. Of course, this is only for males. Now, Ramal also only for males. Women do not have to do this. 
And al yani the concept of covering your right shoulder or uncovering your right shoulder, I should say. Okay. Uncovering your right shoulder. This is an act of worship connected to the tawaf only. Okay. And anywhere where you do ramal, then you uncover your shoulder as well. This is the principle. So al yani uncovering your right shoulder is an act of worship that is connected to the tawaf, where there's ramal. Okay? So that means, when do you uncover your right shoulder, if only akhawat, and when do you cover it? You uncover it once you begin your tawaf, because it's connected to the tawaf. And you end it when? Once you have completed your tawaf. Okay? Once you've completed your tawaf. So, after you've completed your tawaf, you have to pray behind the maqam Ibrahim, na? When you pray behind maqam Ibrahim, should you keep your shoulders uncovered or should you cover it? You should cover it. Why? Because al tiba is connected to what? The tawaf. So, once you, fin once you finish your tawaf, you cover your shoulder. And you pray behind Maqam Ibrahim with covered shoulders. Everyone understand this? Even if the Salah time were to come in and they were to pray the Fard, then you also cover your shoulder and you pray. Tayyip. And then once the prayer is over, you uncover it and you continue your Tawaf. All right? Today, Allah Mustan, you find people from the moment they put on their Ihram, yani they put on their clothing of Ihram and they enter into the state of Ihram, they uncover their shoulder up until the end. Once they've shaved their head or cut their hair, that's when they uncover, that's when they cover their shoulder. And some people still keep it uncovered. Allah Mustan. Yani this deen is based off of Allah wa Rasul wa Sahaba. Hum ulul irfani. This is the way we understand our deen, ikhwani al-khawat. It's not what we think and what we feel and what we see. What is the custom? What is the culture? The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu said what? Khudu anni manasikakum. Take your hajj rights directly from me. Not what you think, not your emotions, not what you think is correct, not what your shaykh said. Take it directly from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Everyone understand this? Ittabi'u ma unzila ilaykum min rabbikum. Follow that was been revealed from your Lord. It's a simple command. Alhamdulillah, Islam is very simple, ikhwan al-khawat. All you need to do is learn and follow. Learn and follow. And do not innovate, do not add, do not decrease. It's very simple. May Allah guide us all. So what is the correct view? Yani the correct action is that you, the iltiba, uncovering the right shoulder, is connected with the tawaf. Tayyib. Both the ramal and both the iltiba, these two actions, yani jogging the first three and uncovering the right shoulder, these two actions are only for those who do, who first arrive to Mecca. That which is referred to as Tawaf al-Qudum, the Tawaf of the arrival, for the Qarin or the Mufrid, okay? And also Tawaf al-Umrah, for the one who first has arrived in Mecca, who, who just come for Umrah, for example, or they've come for Tamattu' and they perform Umrah first. Tayyim? This is when you perform the Raman, as well as the Ittiba'ah. Everyone with me? As for Tawaf al Ifadah, la, do not do that. Khairan? No. Um, oh, one thing I forgot to mention about the touching the black stone. Um, it's it's sunnah to touch both the black stone as well as the Yemeni corner. Okay. And it is sunnah to say Bismillah Allahu Akbar only when you touch the black stone or point to the black stone. As for the Yemeni corner, then you only touch it. The Yemeni corner, okay, that's next to that comes before the black stone, right? The corner that comes before that. Uh, you only touch it without saying anything. 
And of course, as you're walking between the Yemeni corner to the black stone, you recite the door, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana ila akhiri. Tayyip. As for the other two corners of the Kaaba, then they are not touched. And the wisdom for it is because they are not part of the original foundations as built by Ibrahim. You all recall in Sirah, when the Kaaba was destroyed during the time of Prophet Muhammad so me, early on, uh, Quraysh, they went to rebuild it. They wanted to rebuild it. And they made a condition upon themselves that they're only going to rebuild the Kaaba from their purest wealth. And they ran out of pure wealth. And they were unable to build the rest of the Kaaba as it was established by Ibrahim on his Qawaid. Okay? So this is why you see, right, if you take a look at the Kaaba now, there's like a semicircle in one direction, right? One direction. This is the other side of the Kaaba, the other side where the um, black stone is and the Yemeni corner is. Tayyib. Inside, if you go inside that area, you're considered to be in the Kaaba, although it's an open area. Right, you're still, it's still considered to be part of the Qawaid of Ibrahim, the foundation that Ibrahim first laid down. Tayyib. So, if you go inside there and you pray, alhamdulillah, you is as if you're praying in the Kaaba. Tayyib. Rather, you are praying in the Kaaba, you are praying in the Kaaba. Tayyib. Uh, so for that reason, because it, it is short, right, it's not legislated to touch those areas on the other side. It's only legislated to touch the black stone and to say Bismillah Allahu Akbar, Wallahu Akbar and to only touch without saying the tasmiyah the Yemeni corner. Everyone with me so far? Is that clear? So men shouldn't uncover their shoulders or do Ramal and Tawaf wa da'a? No, they should not. This is only for Tawaf al-Qudum for the Qarin and the Mufrid. And the Umrah for someone who comes from Umrah and the Mutmatir. And of course, the Ramal should be done if there's enough space. If there's no space, if it's extremely crowded, obviously, Alhamdulillah, yani you still get the reward if you have the intention. Um, Also, the Ramal is only done in the first three unit, the first three roundabouts. Okay? The first three rounds. If a person were to forget because they feel overwhelmed, there's a lot of people, then they forget to do it. And they remember in the fourth round, they're in the fourth round making tawaf. Can they do the Ramal for the, for the next three? No, they should not. They cannot do it. Why? Because they missed out on that sunnah. That sunnah is only done in the first three. Okay? And if you forget, then you've missed out on the sunnah. But if you have the intention and then you forgot, then you still get rewarded. You get rewarded. But you cannot do it. And there's a principle, Ikhwan and Khawat, there's a principle that every missed sunnah can be made up except for two Except in two cases. Every Miss Sunnah can be made up in sec except in two cases. All right. If making up the Sunnah requires changing the form of the Ibadah, then you cannot make up that Sunnah. So in this case, right, performing the Ramal in the fourth, fifth, and sixth Tawaf would change the form of the Ibadah completely. Right, you're running in the wrong numbers. It will change the form of the ibadah. So therefore, it is lost. Yani you missed out on it in terms of performing it. But you still can receive the reward if you have the intention. If you had the intention, then you forgot. And the second case is if the sunnah was legislated for a reason, for a cause, but then that reason disappears or is removed. Like, for example, when there's an eclipse, what is legislated during the eclipse? The eclipse prayer. Naam? And it's a sunnah to pray the eclipse prayer. But let's say, for example, you were sleeping during this time. Can you make it up and the eclipse is over? Can you make up, can you perform the eclipse prayer outside of its time? Because you missed it? 
No, obviously not. All right. So the principle, once again, is that every sunnah can be made up, except in these two cases. All right. So that includes your rawatib. You know the sunnah, the 12 prayers that you pray outside of your uh, five obligatory prayers? If you miss it for a reason, you can make it up. You can make it up. Even Qiyam al layl the Prophet whenever he missed Qiyam al layl he would make it up when? In the Duha time. In the Duha, at the time of Duha. Tayyib? Now, another issue mentioned by the people of knowledge is what is better? Making Tawaf closer to the Kaaba where there's more people and you're unable to do the Ramal? Or making Tawaf further away from the Kaaba, let's say on the first floor, second floor, third floor, but and there's more space, so you're able to perform the Ramal. What do you think is better, Ikhwan al khawat Is it better to make Tawaf close to the Kaaba and not perform the Ramal due to the overcrowdedness? Or to you know, step out further away and perform the Ramal? Closer to the Kaaba, closer to the Kaaba. Fa'iq says more space. Far away, Nam. Hiba says, Ahsentum. Nam. All of you answered well. The correct opinion, the correct view, is that it's better to go further away in order to perform the Ramal. Why is that? Because the Ramal is connected to the actual ibadah of the Tawaf. It's part of the that al ibadah. It's part of the actual ibadah. While being close to the Kaaba, being close, closer to the Kaaba, is not part of the that al ibadah. You can do tawaf close to the Kaaba, uh, towards further away from the Kaaba, on the first floor and the second floor of the Kaaba, and your tawaf is still accepted. It's it's not part of yani, directly like the Ramal. All right? And there's a principle to help you to know which acts of worship are better than others. And they say, the people of knowledge, they say, مُرَاعَةُ الْفَضْلِ الْمُتَعَلِّقْ بِذَاتِ الْعِبَادَةِ أَوْلَى مِنْ مُرَاعَةِ الْفَضْلِ الْمُتَعَلِّقْ بِزَمَانِهَا أَوْ مِكَانِهَا That essentially, observing the virtue connected to the essence of that act of worship, okay, observing the virtue connected to the essence of that act of worship is more deserving, is, is given greater priority then virtues connected to the time and place of the ibadah. The time and place of the ibadah. So an example, we know the virtue of praying in the first row and praying behind the imam, right? Directly behind him, right? There's a virtue to be close to the imam and pray behind him, all right? However, if there's somebody that's next to you behind the imam and he has a bad odor or he smokes cigarettes and... You can smell it, and it distracts you in your salah. It will take you take your focus away. طيب. What is better, to remain there and be bothered and harmed by that smell and be distracted in your salah, although you're still behind the imam, right? You're still you're right next to the imam, or is it better for you to go at the end of the first row, right? So you're still in the first row, but you're at the end of the first row where that smell is not present, and you're able to focus in your salah. Which of the two is better, Ikhwan and Khawat? To go to the end and have the khushur. Why is that better? Because khushur is connected to the inside of the ibad, the essence of salah. Right? Tumatnina is connected inside of the salah to the prayer. While praying to the praying next to the imam is something connected outside of the prayer. Understand? Everyone understand this? <coughs> Naam. Khushur is more important than the place. Right. Likewise, another example of this is, for example, if Zuhur came in, Zuhur came in, and a person had a long morning, extremely long morning. They worked in the night, day and they're exhausted, like extremely about to pass out. If they were to pray in this state, then they would not be able to benefit and they would not be able to pay attention, be very hard for them. They're just rushing through the salah. All right. Because they, they don't have the energy to pray. Although it's the beginning of the time and this is the best time. Right? Let's say the Dhuhr is not that hot outside. This is the best time to pray early. In this case, what's better for them? To pray in this state where they're exhausted and can't concentrate in their prayer? Or to take a nap, gather their faculties, reset, and wake up an hour after 
and pray Zohar wherein they have their full concentration. What's better? The better action, of course, without a doubt, is to pray, it is, is to uh, sleep, take a nap, so that they can focus inside of the Salah, right? Why was the Salah established? And establish the prayer for my remembrance. It's to remember Allah. So if you're praying without remembering Allah, are you really praying? So you have to remove yani, those barriers, those things that prevent you from focusing in the prayer first, and then you pray. And this is why the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that there's no prayer for the Akbathan, the one who was fighting off uh, using the bathroom. They have to fulfill their need, then they pray. Likewise, you find from the Salaf, whenever a Maghrib came in and it was a fasting day, right? Like Abdullah bin Umar, he will continue to eat while the Adhan and people are praying. Why? So that he removes the distraction. So that when he prays, he's 100% focused. He's 100% focused in his prayer. So yani, this is a principle that anything connected to the actual act of worship, this is more important. This is given priority and is more deserving than something Outside of that act of worship. Everyone understand this? <clears throat> and the hadith goes on to mention قوله تعالى واتخذوا من مقام إبراهيم مصلى فجعل المقام بينه وبين البيت فكان أبي يقول ولا أعلمه ذكره إلا عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. So then Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم after he completed the tawaf he went to pray behind the مقام إبراهيم fulfilling this commandment from Allah سبحانه وتعالى and this is the sunnah to pray two units after the tawaf and scholars mention that uh a person, of course, you pray behind Muqam Ibrahim. However, if there's if there's a crowdedness or extreme, excuse me, extreme overcrowdedness, then you can pray anywhere in the masjid. You can pray anywhere in the masjid due to the need, due to the uh, overcrowdedness. So a person should not cause harm to themselves and others. Rather, be wise, use wisdom. Our deen is based off of ease. Yassiru wa la tu'assiru. Make it easy for the people and do not make it difficult for them. Wallahi, ikhwan, ikhwan, Islam is very easy. Very easy to perform. It's just the people, because of their ignorance, they make it hard upon themselves and others. SubhanAllah. And this is why it's important for us, ikhwan, ikhwan, to learn about the deen. Because if we don't learn about the deen and we remain ignorant, it can kill us. Ignorance kills. You guys know that? Who, who has the evidence for this? How do we know if, how do we know ignorance kills? If you're ignorant, you can be killed because of your ignorance. Nam Ahsent Asiya, the companion who was told to put water in his head and not tayammum. Another example. The man who killed a hundred people. Who was the hundredth person he killed? Huh? It was the Abid who said that he could not right, make Tawbah to Allah. SubhanAllah. Because of his ignorance, he died. So, you yani know that learning your deen, literally your life depends on it. So learn your deen sincerely for the sake of Allah upon the Sunnah of Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah teach us all. Allah I mean. Now, And Maqam Ibrahim, ikhwani wa akhawat, yani praying behind it. This is done for those, for all people who do seven rounds. Okay? Whether they come from Umrah or they come from Hajj, even if they're residents, they're not making Umrah or Hajj, or even if they've come for Hajj and they're just making Tawaf just to make Tawaf. It is legislated that after every seven round, you pray this two units. This is the Sunnah of the Prophet As mentioned by Zuhri, لِكُلِّ usbu'in rakatan. For every seven rounds, there are two units of prayer. Yani the behind Maqam Ibrahim. Everyone understand this? My father said, I do not know that he related it from anyone except from the Prophet. And this shows that Jabir as well as his father, both were companions. 
and that the Prophet of Allah is reciting in two rakat, Surah Al Ikhlas and Surah Al Kafirun. Um, كَانَ يَقْرَأُ فِي رَكَاتَيْنِ قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ وَقُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ What is, when you gather all the narrations together, what is understood that the Prophet so some recited in the first rakat, Surah Al-Kafirun, and in the second rakat, Surah Al-Ikhlas. طيب, and this is in accordance to his, how he would pray. He would make the first rakat longer than the second rakat. Now, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then he returned to the black stone and kissed it, and he as if he was making farewell. And we mentioned that you go back to the black stone if there's a sa'i that comes after the tawaf. If not, then you go on your way. Then he went out of the gate to a safa and, and as he reached it, he recited, Inna safa wal marwata min sha'airillah. Tayyib. In this instance, ikhwani al-khawat, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu did not recite the entire verse. He did not say, Inna safa wal marwata min sha'airillah. Faman hajj al-bayta aw i'tamara fala junaha alayhi an yattawafa bihima. Ila akhir ayah. La. He stopped here. Inna safa wal marwata min sha'airillah. And then he said, Abda'u bima bada Allah bi. This is a very important point. People increase due to what they think, their opinion. Oh, it makes sense for me to complete the ayah. The sunnah, qif haythu waqaf al qawm ikhwani akhawat. Stop where the people stop. Mentioned by Al Za'i, rahimahullah, the great scholar Sham, muhaddith. Stop where the people stop. You, this is where you end. And then you, and then. This is what the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he said. And another narration means Ibda'u, begin with what Allah has began with. طيب? Meaning that you ascend the Safa first and then you perform the actions mentioned in this hadith. Everyone understand this? And today, alhamdulillah, when you go to the Umrah, there's like a, now there's like a, a loha, there's like a, um, a electronic sign where it stops. It used to say the whole verse. But then, mashallah, the, the mashayikh, the ulama, they yani, brought this to the intention of the administration. And now it only shows, إِنَّ الصَّفَا وَالْمَرْوَةَ مِنْ شَعَائِرِ اللَّهِ أَبْدَأُ بِمَا بَدَ اللَّهُ بِهِ طيب. فَجْزَهُمْ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا فَبَدَأَ بِالصَّفَا So the Prophet of Allah, صلى الله implementing the command of Allah, <coughs> implementing the verse of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he ascended as safa first. Faraqiya alayhi. Faraqiya. And it's not faraqa. Some people say faraqa. This is a mistake. Raqa means to perform ruqya. Raqiya means to ascend. Faraqiya alayhi. So he ascended the mountain. Hatta ra al bayt. Until he saw the bait. Fastakbal al qiblata. And he faced the qibla. Tayyib. And even if you are unable to see the bait, you're unable to see the Kaaba, whether you're on the, like maybe on the second floor or third floor, right? It's blocked off. You still have to face. You should face the direction of the Kaaba. And then he said this dua, right? For Wahad Allah wa kabbara wa qal. He singled out the oneness of Allah and he made and he mentioned his glory, uh, his greatness. Wa kabbara, and yani he said takbir. And then he said, La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. Lahu al mulk wa lahu al hamdu wa ala kulli shayin qadir. لا إله إن الله وحده أنجز وعده ونصر عبده وهزم أحزاب وحده. Um, نعم. لا إله إن الله means there's nothing worthy of worship. There's nothing truly worthy of worship except Allah. This is the meaning of this phrase, and it does not mean there's no god but Allah. This is not how it was understood in Arabic, nor is it understood that way during the time of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. Right. لا إله إله is on the scale of فعل. Okay. Fi'al and fi and words on the scale of fi'al mean takes the meaning of words on the scale of maf'ul. Maf'ul. So ilah means ma'bud. Ilah means ma'bud. So la ma'buda. Haqqun. And there's something omitted. Haqqun. Okay. And some people say bihaqqin. However, this is not the most correct because if you say bihaqqin, then this is muta'alliq. You have to add the grammar benefit. So what's better to say is La ila la ma'buda la ma'buda haqqun illallah. There's nothing truly worthy of worship except Allah. And we have a whole entire course, Ikhwan Akhwat, available on our YouTube where we explain 
uh, 40 hadith on La ilaha illallah, the virtues of La ilaha illallah, its meanings, etc. You can find it on our YouTube channel where we went into this in detail. So this is the meaning of it. Wahdahu by himself. La sharika lahu. Wahdahu is affirming, right? More affirmation. La ilaha illallah has an affirmation. It has a negation. First is the negation. La ilaha, right? Negating there's not, nothing worthy of worship. Then you're affirming. Illallah, except Allah. These are the pillars of the this wonderful kalima. Then, uh, then he emphasizes it. Wahdahu. La sharika lah. Wahdahu is an emphasis for the affirmation. Wahdahu by himself. La sharika lah. Is a, is a uh, emphasizer for the negation. La ilaha. Okay. Lahul mulk. Of course, Allah, everything in dominion belongs to him. Walahul hamdu. Wahu ala kulli shayin qadir. Tayyib. Wahu ala kulli shayin qadir. And he is the all powerful over everything. Powerful. Tayyib. There's two words, ikhwan and akhwat, we should understand. The first one being al qadir. We know that Allah is al qadir. And we also know Allah Azza wa Jalla is Al-Qawi. Al-Qawi. Al-Qadir comes from the word Qudra. And this is a description that describes doing an action without incapability. Yani Ajzun. Qudra is the opposite of Ajzun. Ability is the opposite of incapability. Tayyip. Qawi is a description that describes doing an action. Without weakness, without da'af, without da'af. Yani quwa is the opposite of da'af. Okay, someone who's qawi is not da'if. Someone who's qadir is not ajiz. Tayyip, so this is the difference between these two words. All right. Um, Allah Azza wa Jalla is al-qawi al-qadir. He is capable of doing all things. Subhanallah. Subhanallah bihamdi. Laysa ka mithnihi shayt wa huwa al al basir. Right, and there's nothing that's similar to him. And he is the all he is the all here, all seeing. And we have to recognize this meaning, ikhwan, ikhwan, that Allah is Al-Qadir. Al SubhanAllah. If we truly understand that Allah is capable of doing anything He wishes, then we should return back to Him. Right? We should rush back to Him and beg Him to assist us in our affairs. No matter what challenge we're going through right now, no matter what difficulty, if we truly know that should raise our iman. And that should draw us closer to him. And realize that he is the only one who can solve our issues. And he's the only one that can give us and grant us our, our ambitions and our desires. And much more than that. Now, because That there's nothing that can that can escape Allah in the heavens and earth. Nothing that Allah is incapable of doing in the heavens and earth. إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَلِيمًا قَدِيرًا He is certainly the all-knowing, the most capable. Naam. So turn back to Allah, ikhwan al-khawat. When you say this phrase, yani, I want you all to recognize this meaning that Allah truly is capable of doing anything and everything. طيب. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ أَنْزَزَ وَعْدَهُ وَنَصَرَ عَبْدَهُ He fulfilled his promise. He helped his servants. Help the servant. This is um, Allah's help to his servants is not only restricted to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Rather, it includes anyone who learns, follows, spreads, and is impatient and is patient in adhering and adhering to the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Anyone who follows the path of the Prophet Sallallahu they will be helped by Allah Azza wa Jalla as well. What does Allah say? Allah actually mentions that certainly we will assist our messengers and those who believe in the hayat dunya in the world of life, and also on the day in which the testimonies will be established. SubhanAllah. Allah Azza wa Jalla helps those who follow their messenger. So if you want success, if you want victory, in reality, it goes back, yani, it, the affair returns back to following the Messenger Sallallahu following his directives, learning what he has commanded us, and sticking to it, even if it goes against our desires, that we prefer the commands of the Sharia, of, of, the, of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and his Messenger, and what he's revealed in his Sharia, 
over our desires, over our emotions. This is how we bring about success. Not by following your emotions and doing things that brings about displeasure to Allah. Doing things in the wrong manner. Okay? Because we think that this is the means of success. We've seen it done by the kuffar. SubhanAllah. So it could work for us as well. No. Success comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is by following his directives. Following his commands. Staying away from his prohibitions. This is how Nasr occurs. So anyone who follows the Messenger وسلم, will be helped by Allah. Then it mentions narration. This dua, how we should understand it is that the Prophet of Allah وسلم, he said these words La ilaha illallah to the end of it. Then he made dua. This was counted as one time. Then he repeated from the beginning the dhikr. La ilaha illallah wahdahu. Tayyib. And then he made dua again. This is counted as a second time. And then he repeated La ilaha illallah wahdahu ila akhiri. And then he made dua for the third time. This is the third time. This is how we should understand this uh, dua. Everyone, everyone understand this? Yani he made the dhikr, made dua. This is one. And he did that three times. And then after that, he descended. And he walked towards Al Marwa. He walked towards Al Marwa. And this leads us to the part two. I uh, will explain it quickly due to time. Allah must start. You just open it. La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Let me just open it up for you guys. Three day B. Everyone see it now? Is it clear on the screen? Then he descended to Marwa. And when his feet reached the bottom of the valley, he ran. And when he began to ascend, he walked until he reached Al Marwa. Today, Ikhwan and Khawat, um, what this was referring to that there was a valley, meaning you had to go down. Okay? And you had to climb up again after. Ascending after descending Safa, right? You would walk, and then there was a valley, meaning you had to go down, and then you had to climb again, and then walk the rest of the way until you reach Al Marwa. In our day and time, alhamdulillah, the um the government they flattened the area and they placed in it green lights, and they made it very easy for the Hujaj and Mu'tamirun to perform this act of worship. They don't have to do extra. Uh, effort you know, in terms of climbing and ascending, it would be very difficult. SubhanAllah. So, Jazakumullah Khair. May Allah reward them for doing this and servicing the Hujaj. So, what this refers to is the area where there's green lights. Okay? This valley that was once present is now where the green lights are today. And when the Prophet of Allah وسلم, went in this valley, it's reported that he would say at this part, Rabbi Ghfir. He will make this dua. Rabbi ghfir warham. O Allah, cover and hide my deeds and have mercy. And pardon that which you know. Okay. Now, this is referred to as sa'i. So he will perform the sa'i now. Okay, he descended from Safa and he headed towards Marwa. This is referred to as being a Sa'i. All right. And the Sa'i, Ikhwan and Khawat, is different from the Ramal. The Sa'i here, when he would, and especially when he would go down this valley where the green lights are today, he would run in this area. He would run. The running in this area, in this valley, is different from the Ramal in Tawaf. And there are a few differences. One, the Ramal done in Tawaf is only done for the first three rounds of Tawaf. While the Sa'i, yani the running that's done in this, between the green lights today, this is done throughout each round. Each round you have to do it. You have to run through those, through the green lights. This is the first difference. Uh, the second difference is that the running in the, under the green lights 
<clears throat> um, this is only only done where the green lights is found. Okay, it's not done for the entire. You don't run from the entire Safa to Marwa and Marwa to Sa'i uh, to to uh, Safa. You don't run throughout the whole entire thing. As opposed to Ramal, you are jogging for the whole entire three units, the three rounds. You're jogging for the whole entire three rounds without rest. Okay. The third difference is that running in the under the green lights. This is done with more vigor, with more effort. Okay, now you're actually spreading your legs and running. Okay, as opposed to the ramal, where you're kind of jogging, your feet are together. Okay, and the Prophet of Allah has mentioned narration collected in Muslim Imam Ahmed, the Hadith of Habib bin Abi, the Hadith of Habib. It mentions that the Prophet of Allah who is hatta ara rukbatehi min shiddat al-sa'i yaduru bi izaruhu. That the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu would run to the extent that I saw Rukbatehi, SubhanAllah, due to the how fast he was running. Okay? She would see the parts of his body due to the uh, how fast he was running. And his Izar was, was, was and he following him. It was wrapping around him. Okay? And he would say, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Is'aw fa inna Allah he would say, run, for certainly Allah has prescribed upon you all the running and in between Asafa and Marwa under the green lights that we know today, the valley of located in that area. The fourth difference is that Asai yani yeah, doing this action under the green lights today, this is done whenever you do Sa'i. Any legislative Sa'i, you perform this action. طيب. As opposed to the Ramal, then it's only done for the Tawaf Qudum, for the one who is Qarin and Mufrid, and the Tawaf Umrah for the one who has come for Umrah or the Mutamatir. Everyone understands. So these are four differences that helps you to um, differentiate between the types of running and jo slash jogging. طيب. No. So the Sunnah, once again, is to run when you see the green lights. Run quickly. All right, as opposed to Roman, where you're jogging kind of and your feet are together. Taib, he did at Marwa as he did at Safa when he came to Al Marwa for the last time. Yani he did the same thing he did at Safa at Marwa, but when he was at Marwa, there's one exception. He did not recite the, the verse. In Safa wal Marwata min He did not recite that verse. Taib, everything else he did at Marwa. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if I had known beforehand what I have come to know afterwards, I would have not brought sacrificial animals and would have performed Umrah. So he who has not brought the sacrificial animals with him, let him terminate his ihram and intended Umrah. Naam. So this is a clear text to show that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Hajj that he made was Qiran. He was a Qarin and that he preferred Tamatur. And, that, and from this, scholars understand that the best form of Hajj a person can do is the Hajj Tamatur. This is the best form. Although the Prophet ﷺ himself did Qiran, because of this statement, had I known beforehand, etc., to the end of the statement, this shows that he had wished he had done Tamatur. And that because it's more beneficial, it's the best form. Khairan? Naam. <clears throat> Uh, let's speed up a little bit because of time. Then Suraqa bin Malik bin Ju'shum, he got up and asked the Messenger, oh Allah's Messenger, does this apply to this year of ours or is it forever? Yani, the question is related to transferring the Hajj from Qiran or Ifrad to Umrah. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi commanded everyone who did not have a uh, sacrificial animal and they were in Qiran or Ifrad to transfer this Hajj to be an Umrah. So Suraka asks, is it only for this year or is it for the rest of the years? And the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, al umratu fil hajji marratain la bal li abadin abad. Meaning that this could be done forever up until the judgments. That you, if you come for Hajj in, in Qiran or Ifrad, you can change it to Umrah. Tayyib. So that you can perform the tamatur. Okay, you change it to umrah, therefore you perform the umrah. And then when Hajj time comes, okay, 
يوم الترويه the eighth of the hijja you can enter into hajj and with the intention of tamattu and thus obtain the best virtue the best form of hajj um <clears throat> طيب, lastly, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said the Umrah has been incorporated in Hajj. Naam. And this shows الخوات, that the actions of Umrah are the same for Hajj except that which, is that which is specific to Hajj. Meaning that when you do Tawaf for Umrah, it's the same type of Tawaf. The rulings con connected to that Umrah, the Tawaf and the Sa'i are the same thing you do for Hajj. There's nothing different. Okay? And this is why the Prophet Sallallahu he said in the hadith, ثم اسنع في عمرتك ما تسنع في حجك. He said, then do in your umrah that which you do for hajj. Meaning there's no difference in the actions. طيب. And with that, we'll end uh, due to lack of time. Uh, lack of time, Allah was tired and went over. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Hatha wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Subhanak Allahum wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ad. Astaghfiruku wa atubu ilayk. Wafakkum Allah. Intention, it changes via the intention, right? A person comes for Hajj with the intention of Qiran or Ifrad, طيب. they can change their intention that and now it becomes a regular Umrah. Thus, they combine that Umrah and it becomes Tamatur. Yani that Umrah that they perform will be part of the Tamatur and they can exit out of Ihram once they've completed their Sa'i, cut their hair. They finish it, okay? And then when the Yom al comes, they perform the with, with the intention of Hajj Tamattur, and they get the reward of the best type of Hajj. Understand? Wafakukum Allah. Tayyib. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.